All right, welcome back for uh, uh, session number four. This is my first time attending this conference, and the organizer told me that I'm supposed to rant for a while about the, the papers. Uh, this is a session that is devoted to lower bounds in a very heterogeneous collection of uh, contexts. In the first paper, we will see lower bounds for uh, space, and so time-space trade-offs in a particular model of uh, branching programs. In the second talk, we'll see lower bounds in a proof complexity setting for a variant of uh, resolutions. Then we will see positive and negative results for uh, uh, strategies in games that are uh, guaranteed to exist by Tarsk's uh, theorem. Uh, finally, in the last talk, we'll see uh, complexity for uh, the problem of going back and forth in the correspondence between um, anti the sitter space and the uh, conformal field theory. Like if you ask physicists, the ADS UFT correspondence was proved by Maldacena in the 90s. Uh, but actually, this is theoretical physics, so there is no proof. But also, interestingly, there is even no definition. There's no statement uh, of the theorem because conformal field theory doesn't have a formalization that is uh, reasonably formal. So it's like a conjecture that a certain conjecture exists and uh, can be proved. But in restricted form setups, it actually can be formalized and uh, proved. And in these setups, going back and forth, as the fourth talk will argue, is computationally hard. Yeah. All right, so let's, talk, let's start with the first talk. It will be on the random query model and the memory bounded coupon collector by Randraz and uh, Wei Jan. And Wei will give the talk. Uh, so uh, let's first uh, uh, consider this scenario. Let's say you are at a party and you are pre preparing the drinks for the participants. Uh, you want to know whether the uh, majority of the participants prefer coffee or tea. But since it is a party, people are moving around, so every time you can only ask a random person for his uh, or her preference. So this time it may be an Alice, and uh, next time it may be a Charlie, and uh, then it may be Alice again, or don't know. So uh, by the coupon collector's pro uh, problem, you'll know that if there are n participants, you need to ask about n log n times to collect all the information so that you know the uh, majority preference. But uh, it depends that on that you have a perfect memory of everyone's answer, everyone's previous answer. What happens if you don't have perfect memory? You can only remember uh, very specific, or very, uh, you can only uh, have, uh, uh, you only have a very small memory of the uh, people's answers. Then how many times do you need to ask? Or let's consider a more com uh, computational scenario where the data is, is divided and uh, separately stored on N servers. The servers do not communicate with, with each other, but they are constantly broadcasting the data to a public channel. Now a client enters and listens to this channel. What, he, uh, what it can hear every time is just an index and the data of a random server. Then uh, if, the, if this client is memory bounded, then how many times does it take to compute a specific function over the data? So uh, we give the, the above problems, the uh, computation tasks a name, which we call it the uh, random query model. 
So uh, formally, uh, the task of this model is to compute an uh, m-bit Boolean function. Uh, in the standard query model, every time you can choose an index and to query the bit at that specific index. But in the random query model, every time what you will, what you will receive is the random sample, which consists of an index which is uni uniformly random over one to n, and the bit at that index. And we are interested in the uh, trade-offs between the time and space to compute this function. Uh, an algorithm under the random query model can be specified by a branching program where each node have, uh, has two n outgoing edges representing the two n possible samples you received each time. Uh, the time will be the length of the branching program and the space will be the logarithmic of the width of the branching program. And uh, as I said, the uh, each index is uniformly random, but I didn't specify the joint distributions of the indices. Uh, in this talk, we consider two cases of the joint distribution. The first one is the simplest one, the independent distribution, which literally means that the uh, indices you receive at each time uh, will be mutually independent. But we also consider a more general case, which we call the recurring distributions. Uh, the, in the recurring distribution, the only dependencies between the indices are equalities. So here you see that, the, for example, the red indices are ensured to be the same, the blue ones are ensured to be the same, but between uh, different colors, they are still uh, mutually independent. Okay. But uh, for most of this talk, we will focus on the uh, independent distribution. Uh, let's first take a look at the example the, uh, to compute the parity function. The parity function is not so interesting in the standard query model for study time-space trade-offs because you can just uh, query uh, each bit exactly once and you will need only one bit of the space uh, of the memory. But in the uh, random query model, things are different. Because you have S space, a natural way to uh, do it is to divide the data into N over S parts, each part consists of S bits. You start with the first part, uh, you wait until you see every bit in this part. And then you will know the par parity of the first part. Uh, you store the, this partial parity and you clear your memory and you move on to the next part, wait until you, you see every bit in this part and update the par partial parity and go on. Uh, in each part, you need about n samples to uh, collect uh, every bit in this, uh, in this part, so uh, the total time will be uh, n squared over s. But there is another totally different algorithm which achieves the same trade-off between time and space. Uh, uh, this time, you will divide the, uh, uh, you will divide the input into uh, s parts instead of n over s parts. And uh, what you want to do is to approximate the Hamming weight of each part by uh, counting how many ones you received uh, with, uh, within each part. So uh, you just have to maintain S numbers, F1 to Fs. And when you receive a one, you increase the frequency count by one. And if you receive a zero, you do nothing, and so on. And by some concentration bounds, you will see that you need about it and over S samples to approximate the Hamming weight of each part with error much smaller than one. And since you approximate the Hamming weight with error much smaller than one, then you also know the parity. So these two totally different algorithms both achieve the same time-space trade-off, which leads us to think that it might be tight. What we prove in this uh, uh, paper is that uh, this trade-off, this quadratic trade-off is indeed tight but with more restrictions. The restrictions we've had is the zero error computation. So in bounded error, uh, bounded error computation, you want to output with a constant advantage. In the zero error computation, you can choose to not to output, or say, I don't know. Uh, but you have to output with constant probability, and whenever you output, the output must be correct. Uh, what we prove in this paper is that uh, computing the parity function with zero error requires a quadratic trade-off between time and space, 
with the independent distribution of the indices you received. And here's the roadmap of uh, reductions we used to uh, prove this trade-off. Uh, the first step is the reduction from the zero error coupon collector problem. So as I said, as I said the coupon collector's problem states that a coupon collector has to, uh, uh, collect, uh, has to receive at least n over uh, n log n coupons to collect all n coupons, all, all n different coupons. Uh, but in the zero error coupon collector problem, the collector also needs to claim that it has received all coupons. And whenever it claims, the claim must be correct. Uh, so it is, it is the reduction from, from the zero error coupon collector to the zero error computation of parity is very trivial. It's just because if you want to compute the parity, you at least have to receive all n bits, right? Uh, and, but uh, uh, if we focus on the bounded error version of these problems, the problem is that the bounded error coupon collector is not so interesting. The, uh, uh, the time will be uh, n log n, and you don't need any memory. You can just claim that the, you have received all coupons. So we have to add the uh, zero error condition here. And uh, now it suffices to prove a quadratic trade-off for a zero error coupon collector's problem. And uh, since we have removed the, uh, the n bit input and we only f care about the indices we received, now the branching program is, is a branching program so that each node have n outgoing edges labeled by the indices we received. And uh, if the branching program uh, solves this zero error coupon collector problem, we can label the no each node of the branching program uh, with a subset of the indices. So intuitively, this label means the uh, uh, indices you receive, uh, you are sure to receive when you reach this node. And uh, we, uh, this uh, label will, <coughs> will satisfy the following properties. You start with an uh, empty set. You finally have to reach the entire set. And if you add the independence uh, guarantee of the indices you received, then you also satisfy a soundness property. Now, what What's left is to prove that such a branching program with uh, labels satisfying the above properties have to have a quadratic trade-off between time and space. And uh, I will not go into the details, but what's interesting is that this step, uh, it does not require the independent distribution over the indices. It also works for uh, recurring distributions. Uh, now is the time to uh, talk about why do we care about the recurring distribution because the independent distribution will be more natural. Why do we care about recurring? Uh, the reason is that it is closely related to the uh, lower bounds for uh, oblivious branching programs. Uh, so the current best uh, uh, lower bound for time space trade-offs of uh, branching programs is uh, just a little bit better than trivial and uh, it dates back to almost 30 years ago by uh, Babai Nizan and uh, And what we proved in our work is that uh, for every uh, Boolean function, you can design another Boolean function so that uh, if the uh, new, <coughs> uh, uh, yeah, if the new Boolean function can be computed by a deterministic oblivious branching program, then the original one can be uh, computed with bounded error under the random query model with uh, some recurring distribution. So that means any lower bound for uh, uh, bounded error computation with a recurring distribution will translate to a lower bound for uh, oblivious branching programs. So the problem is that uh, can we bypass these two additional zero error and independence guarantees and uh, directly prove such a lower bound for parity? Uh, ideally, it will be quadratic, but uh, if not, any, uh, anything polynomially better than trivial will be uh, a breakthrough in uh, time space trade-off of branching programs. But it still seems to be a little bit far-reaching, so uh, the intermediate problem we are interested in is that uh, what happens if the, we only add the independence guarantee? So this is conjecture we uh, propose uh, is that uh, uh, computing bounded error parity uh, with e even independent distribution will require a quadratic trade-off between time and space. 
And uh, uh, even though we have a lot of nice properties of branching programs for these tasks, uh, still uh, we don't know how to how to prove such a lower bound even better than true, uh, 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 meaningful, any meaningful lower bound will be interesting. So uh, this will be a interesting open problem for future research. Yes, thank you. Any questions? So well, thanks again. Aviat is going to give the next talk, which is on uh, task theorem, supermodular games, and the complexity of uh, equilibria. Thanks, Luca. Um, so you, everyone in this room knows the binary search algorithm. Hopefully everyone in this room also knows the uh, deferred acceptance algorithm, sometimes also called the uh, Gale Shapley or the stable matching or stable marriage uh, algorithm. And I think no one is, in this room has ever thought of what do these two algorithms have in common? Does anyone have a guess? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you keep thinking about this uh, for, a little, for a few more slides. Uh, this is the, sort of the title of, of our paper. It's a joint work with uh, Kusha, Christos, and Michalis. And uh, this is uh, Tarki's fixed point theorem. It was proved by Knaster in uh, 28. So we have, there's a complete lattice. You don't need to know what's a complete lattice. It's just uh, n to the d. And there is a monotone function. Just means if y is bigger than x at every coordinate, then so will f of y be bigger than f of x. And if these two uh, conditions hold, then the fixed points of f form a lattice. You don't need to know that what that is either, just that f has a fixed point. So there is some x such that f of x equals x. Okay. So uh, here's an example. You can see, for example, if you look at the, uh, your top right corner, that 4, 5, and 5, 5 both uh, uh, point to 5, 4, or so it's, it's, they're both pointing the same thing, so it's uh, greater than or equal. And the, the uh, fixed point, if you haven't found it yet, is uh, 2, 2 at the bottom left. Questions? Good. So, um, great. So, so there, there is here, in, oh yeah, I should tell you the proof. So, here's the proof just for the, the existence of the fixed point. So, you can start with the all zero uh, vector. And then assume a contradiction that you don't have a fixed point. So f of 0 is going to be not 0, so it's going to be bigger than 0. And then f of that is going to be bigger than that, because there is no fixed point. And then you keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But at some point, you're bounded by n in every coordinate, which is a contradiction. So this proof comes with uh, an algorithm. And you can iteratively, iteratively apply f. The problem is that this is inefficient. So we need uh, like order n times the uh, queries or time, but we can hope for uh, something that's polynomial in log of n. And uh, this sounds uh, pretty familiar. We have an existence proof, but uh, it doesn't come with an algorithm, and we're very curious about the complexity of this. So uh, the question is, you have a fixed point. Can you find it? Okay. Does anyone have a, a guess of the riddle from the... So, he, so, 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 so he, here, here are two special cases of, uh, uh, where we can actually find the fixed point efficiently. If, you have, um, if the lattice is just a line, then uh, binary search finds uh, the fixed point of f. There is a very complicated uh, lattice that you can size 2 to the n, over, two to the n squared, where uh, the deferred acceptance algorithm finds a fixed point of this lattice. And in both cases, the algorithm runs in time that is logarithmic in the size of the lattice. And uh, my question is, what if you have a general lattice, or even general n to the d, can you find the fixed point efficiently? So here are a few things that we know about this uh, question. First of all, we, we came up with a, a very nice algorithm. It's log to the power d of n. Uh, then we realized some other, many other people came before us. This is the earliest reference we can find. It's uh, Dang Chin Ye in an unpublished technical report. Uh, 
It was also in, in a cheese uh, thesis, so it's published. Uh, the, so for d equals 2, we actually have a matching lower bound log squared. So we beat this. Uh, in general, you can't hope to logo do exactly logarithmic, like um, uh, stable matching or um, binary search. But can you actually get the, so it's like a fine grain complexity lower bound. But main open problem is, can you actually get uh, log to the th three uh, harness for d equals 3, or uh, even better? Okay. In terms of co uh, computational complexity, you can think of what it, when f is given as a circuit, and then it turns out this problem belongs to PLS and PPAD, and there is some connection to uh, game theory. My co-authors are very, very excited about these uh, super modular games. I never completely understood what they are. Uh, you can ask them next time you see them. Uh, there, there's plenty here, and the, I won't have time to go over anyway. So. Uh, Containment, containment in PLS is uh, very simple. It's just uh, the proof that I showed, the one-line proof that I showed you earlier. Uh, it's just a potential function. It's the sum of the um, xi's. And every time you apply f, the sum of xi's uh, increases. So it's uh, in uh, PLS. PLS is uh, stuff related to potential functions. Okay. I, won't, I don't have time to show you the proof of PPD. It's not super complicated. You can ask me offline. But I want to tell you this is super surprising. Uh, uh, when Michalis uh, sent us this proof, I was sure there is no way this could possibly be true, but uh, it works and it's, it's very, very beautiful. And it's not, it's, I'm a co-author, but it's not really my proof, so I can tell you it's amazing. Uh, but what I really want to talk to you about is this intersection of PLS and PPAD. So uh, in case you haven't been following this uh, area of uh, TF and P of total uh, problems, so there is uh, PPAD, which is the complexity of uh, Nash and uh, market equilibrium, etc. PLS captures the complexity of uh, pure Nash equilibrium in games where the pure Nash equilibrium exists. And then PPAD has those pairing classes, PPA and PPP. And for a long time, we didn't have uh, natural open problems. And uh, very nice uh, results from the last couple of years. Now we have uh, natural open problems for all these uh, classes. So by the way, I should tell you what's a natural open problem. Not natural problem, not natural, natural, natural complete problem, sorry. So a natural problem, uh, we don't have a formal definition. It depends, it's subjective, and depends on the context, etc. Uh, a necessary condition is that your problem definition doesn't have a circuit in the, in the definition. If you have a circuit, it can still be very interesting, but then you can just ask, ask about query complexity. There is no reason to study the computational complexity. Okay. So anyway, all these, all these uh, well-studied classes now have uh, natural complete problems. There is uh, this very exciting area of PPD intersect PLS. And that's the, uh, what's really hot in uh, TFNP now. So PPAD intersect PLS, there's a lot of uh, research in the past decade. And I think the, one of the, our holy grail for the next decade is, or this new decade, is to find a, a complete problem for one of those subclasses. OK, so very exciting research direction. And we have this, uh, so now we know that supermodular games are also in PPAD intersect PLS. And you can try to find their try to prove they're also complete for one of those uh, classes on the left. Good. Now let me tell you about the query complexity in the remaining four minutes. So here's the sketch of the algorithm. So the idea is to recursively find fixed points of uh, dimension uh, d minus one. So for example, the blue points on the left. If you only care at each column separately. You can think of uh, where f is pointing upwards and where f is pointing downwards, and you can do binary search to find the blue point where f is uh, neutral in log n queries. And similarly, the, right, the red points on the right is uh, the neutral point for the right and left. And now we just want to find the intersection of these uh, two curves. So you can do this. If you uh, have the points in the red curve, you can. Um, do binary search in the red curve, and to find each point of the red curve, you need log to the d minus 1 uh, points times log n for the binary search. So that's log to the power of d. OK, so, so this is algorithm is, is uh, like sub-exponential algorithm, but it's still not uh, still far from point on because we have this exponential dependent, uh, dependence on d. And now we'd like to prove that this is optimal. And the natural thing is to uh, just imitate this algorithm when you construct the lower bound. So I already showed you the uh, hard instance. It's this. Let me uh, color code it for you so it's easier to see what's going on. 
So the pink points are uh, points where f, the direction of f is not diagonal. It's either pointing only down or only left or only right. So in one of the dimensions, it's a fixed point. And then you can um, binary search on the pink points to find the blue point, which is a full fixed point. So finding, we have this uh, path of, fig, of uh, pink points, and finding each point on the path costs log and queries. And then you need to binary search on the path to find the blue point, which is a full fixed point. And that's another log and query, so there is a log squared. It's a very simple construction. Any questions? Super simple, right? And now, the, the, the main question is you want to do the same thing with uh, d greater than 2. So, uh, you know, analyzing the construction is also very easy, so I, I, don't, I didn't show you the anal analysis. Analyzing it is also very easy. But just uh, you want to generalize this construction to, say, d equals 3 or even more. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts after if you, if you know how to do this. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, we had the Tarski's fixed point theorem that says that if you have a monotone function, you have a fixed point, and we have the big open problem of uh, query complexity. You want to prove a log to the d Lorabon, and computational complexity, we prove that it's ins PLS intersect PPAD, which is the, uh, where the hot question of uh, total problems. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So, uh, the, the stable marriage problem B was two, right? No. Uh, so the, 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 the sorry. Oh, yes, thanks. So for the stable marriage problem. I, so I told you the stable marriage problem is a special case of this uh, uh, Tarski uh, fixed point theorem. So the, it's actually not, this is an exception to what I said, it's, this is actually not the n to the d, it's some other lattice. The size of lattice is 2 to the n squared. So there are 2 to the n squared uh, points in the lattice. And we can solve uh, the uh, deferred acceptance algorithm works in time n squared. So that's like log of the size of dimension. So in, in the in the deferred acceptance algorithm, okay, okay, sorry. So I'll repeat the question. So what's the f that we're uh, computing the fixed point uh, for? So in the deferred acceptance algorithm, no, it's 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 very not apparent. Uh, in binary search, you can take any monotone function on the line, and just if if, if it's pointing up, go up. If it's pointing down, go down. Do the regular binary search, and just by monotonicity, it works. Talk is joint work with Bill Pfefferman and Umesh Vazirani on the computation of pseudo randomness, complexity equals volume, and constraints on uh, ADS CFT duality. All right, great. Yes, thank you very much, and thanks for staying until the last talk of the day. So, this is based on joint work with Bill Pfefferman and Umesh Vazirani, who's in the audience. So, the starting point for this talk is a question. Can circuit complexity be physical? So, in other words, is there a universe in which circuit complexity, in other words, the minimum number of gates that you need to compute some function or prepare some quantum state, is physical? In other words, it's some measurable quantity like distance or brightness or heat or time. Uh, this seems like a very strange question to ask uh, from a computer science standpoint because complexity is usually something that's really difficult to pin down or measure. But believe it or not, there have actually, there's been a serious proposal that circuit complexity has physical ramifications and is a physical quantity in the context of black holes. 
In fact, this idea emerged from something called the It From Qubit collaboration. This is a Simons collaboration on quantum gravity. And there have been a huge number of papers exploring this idea that circuit complexity could be a physical thing. If you look for this on Google Scholar, you'll see that there have been papers from the last few years with hundreds of citations. So what's, what's going on here? Well, the origin of this interest in circuit complexity comes from the search for a theory of quantum gravity. So one of the major open challenges in theoretical physics has been to create a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity. And this is extremely difficult, both because it's difficult to construct consistent theories that capture both quantum mechanics and gravity, and also because there are a number of obstacles to the creation of such a theory. Namely, these arise from certain paradoxes that arise when you consider what happens to quantum information in the presence of black holes. So these are some, you might have heard of the black hole information paradox of Hawking. This is one of the first uh, incidences of this. But there has been some progress towards trying to define a theory of quantum gravity. And one of these bits of progress has been the development of something called the ADS-CFT correspondence of Maldacena. What is this correspondence? Well, it's a conjecture duality between a theory of quantum gravity and a theory of quantum mechanics. The quantum gravity theory lives in something called anti-de Sitter space. The quantum mechanics theory is something called a conformal field theory. That's where the name comes from. But for, all, for our purposes, just think of one side being gravity, the other being quantum mechanics. And uh, what they believe is present here is that on each side of the theory, I'm uh, sorry, there are two theories here, each of which has an associated Hilbert space. And moreover, there's a map called the dictionary th that maps states in one theory to states in the other theory and operators in one theory to operators in the other theories. And this map is in some sense a homomorphism between the theories. Um, so this is really exciting to people because it's saying that this is a way of constructing a theory of quantum gravity. You can just study this quantum mechanical theory on the right-hand side that we understand relatively well and look at its image through this dictionary and then you can then build a theory of quantum gravity from that. So you can think of this a little bit in analogy to linear programming duality. If you have a dual linear program, a lot of times you can learn a lot about its solution from the, for, from, if you have a primal, you can learn a lot about it by studying the dual. So uh, an interesting fact of this uh, kind of conjectured ADS-CFT correspondence is it hasn't been fully worked out. Rather, it's a conjecture duality that they've computed for specific kind of toy instances or toy problems, and they're conjecturing that it's something that's extendable to kind of a, a complete theory of duality. So I'd say that the ADS-CFT duality is, is under construction in some sense. But one obstacle or kind of thought experiment that's been challenging in constructing this duality is something called the wormhole growth paradox. The paradox goes something like this. So if you look at the left-hand side theory, the gravity theory, um, gravity admits solutions to Einstein's equations known as two-sided black holes or wormholes. So these are black holes that connect two distinct regions of space-time. And what these wormholes do is this, they just kind of stretch and grow with time. This throat connecting the two space-times actually grows linearly even for an exponential amount of time. So it's kind of a theory that never equilibrates in some sense. On the other hand, the right-hand side theory, this quantum theory, is believed to look very differently. It's, uh, it's a theory that equilibrates very quickly. You can think of it as like a blender. It's something that's called a scrambling theory, which means that uh, locally defined quantities in the theory equilibrate in polynomial time. So the challenge that then emerged in this area is, you know, what quantity on the right-hand side could be the dual to volume? If you believe this duality exists that's under construction, then there should be some quantity on the right-hand side that's the dual to volume. And what could that be if it can't be uh, any kind of locally defined quantity in the quantum theory? Um, and this is where circuit complexity came into play here, because uh, 
in 2014, Susskin conjectured that um, the resolution to this paradox is by assuming that complexity or conjecturing that complexity is physical. So in particular, Susskin conjectured that the quantum mechanical dual to the wormhole volume is the circuit complexity of the state on the, on the right-hand side. That is literally the number of two qubit gates that are required in the smallest quantum circuit to create the state. And the, the intuition for making this conjecture was something like this. So if you think about how this system evolves with time as the wormhole grows, it looks like you have some fixed circuit U and you just apply the circuit U many times. So the state of your system looks like you apply U T times um, to some initial state psi. And the intuition is that there should be no shortcuts to preparing the state. So in other words, that the complexity of U to the T psi should be roughly T times the complexity of U. And therefore, the circuit complexity could be this quantity that grows linearly with time for an exponential amount of time um, and uh, therefore be the correct dual. And there have been several works trying to give supporting evidence for this conjecture. So for instance, um, both from the complexity side where they tried to show that you know, it's reasonable to believe that for certain U, circuit complexity grows with time and from the physics side as well. But this brings us back to our original problem, which is, you know, can circuit complexity be physical? That's the way, that's what the physicists have proposed as a way of getting out of this paradox. But, you know, our intuition here as complexity theorists is that, you know, this seems very weird because complexity is something that's so difficult to estimate or measure by pseudo-randomness arguments. And in fact, there was a paper of Ji Liu and Song that showed that in certain uh, quantum mechanical models, you can have quantum analogs of pseudo-randomness, something called pseudo-random states, that do mean quantum circuit complexity is difficult to compute. So if this is true, how could quantum circuit complexity be physical? Well, it turns out that formalizing this kind of discomfort that a complexity theorist feels with this conjecture is surprisingly difficult. Um, the reason is that there's only a very tiny subset of quantum states that are at play in this conjecture. And secondly, the states that, that the physicists are considering in making this conjecture for um, are described in a very physics-y language that, where it's not entirely clear what they mean from a computer science standpoint. So one thing that we set out to do in this work is to figure out, well, you know, what are these states and do they admit pseudo-randomness? And if so, what does this mean for ADS-CFT? So the first of our results is to kind of formalize this problem into a way that's understandable to a computer science or quantum information kind of audience. So this involved a lot of kind of translation work from the physics literature to a reasonable toy model. And the toy model looks something like this. So let's let you be this evolution of the quantum system that I described before. The set of allowed states in this quantum system looks something like the following. You have some initial state psi naught, and then you can apply u, and then apply some local operator O1, and then apply u again, and apply O1, another operator O2, et cetera, where each of these OIs is a one qubit gate. So you can think of this, uh, maybe the right way to think about it is these are states just like the one I described before, where you have some fixed circuit that you're just kind of repeating many times, stacking it on top of each other. But now you're allowed to apply a small number of gates in between. And these gates are called shocks, and only very few of them are allowed in the system. Um, and this is just a very weak model. So our second result, as you might guess, is that we instantiate a pseudo-random state ensemble within this very small subset of states. The basic idea is to pick a random pattern of these operator insertions and take that as your secret key. And we give evidence for the following conjecture that if you had many copies of the state, it would be very difficult to distinguish that state from truly random. And that immediately implies it's very difficult to estimate the complexity of these states. 
Uh, for reasons of time, I'll skip through some of our more technical results. And uh, our third result is that we describe the ramifications that this has for ADS-CFT. So what we show is that you know, the fact we can create pseudo-randomness here means that Susskind's conjecture is equating some quantity which is difficult to compute with one that's easy to compute. So that means that the dictionary between these theories has to be exponentially complex. So that means this is very unlike LP duality, where you can very easily translate between the dual theories. Rather, you know, this dictionary will in some sense be permanently under construction because it's exponentially hard to compute even with a quantum computer. Finally, our final result is to show that these conclusions are unavoidable in the theory. So if you actually look deeper into the argument, um, you, you will realize that our results are not contingent on Susskind's conjecture, but actually apply to any resolution of this wormhole gross paradox. And this is basically because the pseudo-randomness arguments are very powerful. Um, they show that any complexity-like quantity that could be the dual is difficult to compute. So this is an, kind of an inevitable feature of ADS-CFT. All right, so I'll now wrap up. So in short, we started from this conjecture that Susskind had that complexity is physical, and we translated this to a computational model. And then we then showed that pseudo-randomness is actually present in this model which means that this ADS-CFT dictionary that they're describing has to be exponentially hard to compute because it has to be equating some quantity that's hard to compute that behaves like circuit complexity with something that's physical, like the volume of a wormhole. And we showed that this is independent of Susskind's conjectures. Um, there are several interesting questions kind of remaining here. Uh, for instance, we actually required assuming that quantum gravity is simulable by a quantum computer in our arguments, and there is kind of a lot of interesting questions to be asked as to what this means in the relativistic theory when there, you know, there's no universal notion of what time or space or energy is. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. People have questions. I guess my question was whether it was mm -hmm. obvious that the volume of wormholes would be something easy to compute in the first theory. Well, uh, it's kind of addressed by I guess the last bullet point of your conclusions. That yes, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's actually not entirely obvious that the volume of a wormhole is easy to estimate in the theory because actually. If you're any, there's some statement that any one observer in the theory can't actually personally measure the wormhole volume, but uh, it is a property that you could kind of aggregate from the experiences of many observers. So this is actually where we have to assume this kind of quantum extended church Turing thesis to say that those experiences of different observers are, are indeed simulable. So yeah, it's a good question. Other questions? Well, let's thank Adam and all the